So thank you everyone for joining us for the June edition of AZ Bio Peers. As you know, we focus on the skills, the resources, and the experiences that help life science innovators succeed. And we are absolutely thrilled to have with us today a Tales from the Road with Tassos Giancakis. And I'm going to ask Tassos to tell a little bit about himself, because if I read his bio to you, we'd use up for a full hour. So with that, Tassos, welcome to AZ Bio Peers. Um, please tell the group just a little bit about who you are. You bet, Joan. Thanks. And appreciate everybody joining us this morning and really thankful for the invitation. You know, I, I've been in Arizona here. My family and I moved down here. I've got three young boys just about a year ago. So it's been great to get to know the community, um, pushing biotech. And Joan, you're a force in that uh, <laughs> aspect. I, so I'm, I grew up in Chicago. I'm a, um, a biochemical engineer by training, started my career off working in Merck over in Philadelphia, their West Point facility, doing a vaccine R&D and pivoted into essentially a business development type of role where I kind of, I'll spare you guys the, the details on the professional journey, but I, I through business school, I moved into more of a um, business side of the science, moved out to the Bay Area in 1998. And uh, up until very recently, that's where I was, I helped start up four companies. Uh, most recently was Myocardia, which we'll talk about today, which was my first CEO job. Uh, learned an incredible amount about leadership and about culture and company development. It was an amazing experience. Um, and I'm looking forward to sharing a lot of that with you, but entirely focused on so far on developing novel medicines. Um, I've been spending some time over the last year really thinking about convergence of data science, et cetera, and helping increase our productivity and changing kind of the math a little bit on how um, on the costs of providing amazing care uh, and included in that is novel therapies, but uh, maybe we'll get into some of that throughout the course of the moment. That would be terrific. And, uh, you know, Tassos and I have talked about this before. So I grew up in Wilmington, Delaware, right across um, the, the state line from Philly. And um, he and I were both in the Bay Area about the same time. So it's, right it's fun to have see how the paths cross and, and where you end up correct connecting in your career so when we look at myocardia and we decided we'd focus on myocardia today just because um, we have a limited amount of time it had a phenomenal exit obviously one of the biggest of the year for 13.5 billion dollars to bms but um it didn't start out that big. You know, how did you build it? And what were some of the key elements of your company culture that, that allowed it to succeed like that? Yeah, the company, I have to say, was, um, let's see, it was founded um, in, I would say, 2011, 2012. And it was incubated at Third Rock Ventures. So it's a, you guys might be familiar with Third Rock out in Boston. And I have to say, at the time, um, Third Rock had noticed that there was a wave of precision medicine that was making its way outside of oncology. We were seeing things happening in, you know, gene therapy. There are companies like Bluebird Bio and Blueprint that they had started, Foundation Medicine that they had started. And the thinking there was, I think, inspired by Vertex's therapies back then in cystic fibrosis that were small molecules, but still focused on a genetic target. And the way they operated was through essentially allosteric modulation of the biological target. Um, there was an idea there that had we advanced enough of our thinking around the genetic drivers and the targeting of cardiovascular disease to think about doing something analogous now that we're seeing in all these different therapeutic areas in CV. So they, that was the idea that was born. That was it. There wasn't any like cool technology. There wasn't let's license something out from, you know, uh, the hutch or from the broad, right. it was, we got an important medical problem. It looks like other fields are pulling some stuff together. Um, so let's figure it out. So I have to give a lot of credit to third rock for kind of putting that on the table. What they did was they just assembled 
the world's leading experts that had very complimentary experience in this area. And I intersected them when there was about, I don't know, like 10 or 12 people in the company. And it was, it had just moved out of incubation at Third Rock and um, it was hardcore science. And, you know, for me, I had done a lot of leadership and management of groups. I had never managed the hardcore scientists directly. So <laughs> there was a lot of learning here for me. I've always been around it. Um, but to really think about how I can support, you know, the chief scientific officer who was in the company at the time doing essentially like, you know, borderline basic research um, and really early drug discovery was was new for me. And so I leaned on some things that we'll get into through the course of the conversation. But primarily one of the major aspects I brought to it was, you know, connection and development with people. I mean, I, I hadn't been a CEO before. I didn't have like this legacy of like, you know, success as a CEO with, you know, incredible followership. And let me just, you know, snap my fingers and I'll get the band back together. It was all new. And, um, you know, that was what I was going to sink or swim on. And so making connections and understanding people's motivations, thinking about how to get the right sort of skill sets together, being very clear about the strategy. That was it in the early days. And, you know, being true to the science. Um, so we started there and that's when I joined, it was a private company. It had just been funded by third rock ventures at the time. It's funny. It seems like I spent the last year saying that this was not a large series a round, but it feels like a large one. Now in this market, it was a $38 million series a round. I think in the intervening period, there were like, you know, $90 million series a rounds that people would do. Um, and, you know, that was a testament to Third Rock and their conviction that that size allowed us to really think big about the scientific vision. And, uh, you know, we just needed more and more capital. And I would say maybe a few years after that, um, after we had some phase one data from our our lead program, we uh, we knew we wanted to go public. We went public. We had done one Series B financing just for context here for folks. Um, and that was the one, uh, it was a crossover round. Um, and I'll tell you, it was, I don't think any of our financings were pretty, frankly. I mean, I can tell you this, it was, it was 2000 and um, yeah, it was 2008. Is that right? No, I'm sorry. It was 2000 no. and it was heading into 2016. It was okay. heading into the presidential election. And if you guys recall, drug pricing always kind of comes up. Um, Hillary Clinton was very focused on this. I think she tweeted out about Martin Shkreli at the time. And mm -hmm. I'm sitting in, you know, Boston with the BlackRock PM on the IPO Roadshow. And she just interrupted me five minutes in and she's like, look, I just have to tell you, I love what you're doing. My portfolio is down about 40% today. I'm a little distracted. And um, think of us for the follow on. I'm like, oh, crap. So we <laughs> were sitting here. And we weren't sure if we were going to pull off the IPO. We priced under, which was a little bit of a theme for us because we were in a new space that, you know, if people had some experience in cardiovascular medicine, it wasn't good. And, you know, it took a lot of convincing to get folks to imagine a, de a development program that didn't require like 20,000 people and a billion dollars in a phase three. So we priced under all the time. I had one board member who I really miss who told us, you know, hey, congrats on doing half of the IPO. Let me know when you're going to complete it, right? Because <laughs> we raised half the money, <laughs> but we're glad we did. And, you know, if anything, there's inspiration here to look at how, you know, you finish, not how you start. And um, markets will change and data and people win. And I mean, even in this market last week, right, we saw some great data and it moved the stock and people financed. And so uh, that's got to be our North Star. You know, it's, it's interesting when we talk about great advisors. And I remember um, when I was in the Bay Area, uh, we were launching a new application-specific integrated circuit um, segment. And I had, you know, these rock star PhDs that had to teach me everything that I needed to know um, about the science because I didn't know the science. Um, and when you're making plans that involve them, you have to rely on them to help you along that journey. Um, one of my other great advisors is my mom. And my yeah. mom's favorite thing is when you make plans, God laughs. So <laughs> tell me, you know, across this journey, how did your business plan evolve over time? 
Yeah, I will say this. I think essential as I look back and reflect on, you know, what was like super important about myocardial success, recognizing that, you know, we're in a hyper dynamic um, context, right? I think we are in one of the most exciting and challenging industries around. I mean, we have scientific curveballs, we have legislative and regulatory curveballs, and then we have the usual stuff that, you know, market changes, people, and, you know, and it's a, it's a very dynamic landscape today more than ever as it relates to, you know, the standard of care that we're chasing to improve if you're thinking about therapeutic development. So, I mean, it's really fun, but it's crazy to think about how many moving parts we have to deal with. So I would advise, and, and as I think about it, spend the time early on to understand what the mission of the company is and really articulate it in a way that's amplifiable and then focus on the values that you want to um, concentrate in the organization. We did that pretty early at Myocardia and it was it was it it was everything because mm -hmm. as the world changes, the way you can keep momentum while you are getting whipped around here and your 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 mom is wise. I mean, you know, every plan we had, we knew was going to be wrong, but the discipline, the communication of the plan in particular, thinking about what could ch change the plan for the upside or downside. We spent a lot of time um, talking about this and giving everybody as many people in the company as we could, like the full picture, the full context. We didn't sort of compartmentalize. I mean, the accounting team knew what research was doing. The research team understood what our financing strategy was, you know, what what we wanted to do with, you know, benefits for the company. Um, and it was that kind of culture which when things happen to you, and I'll tell you some specific things, you know, I remember getting a phone call after um, after uh, January 1st, you know, we wanted to get some news out that was coming around our partnership with Sanofi. We had a, a, a strategic relationship with Sanofi, which for us, we knew early on in the company to do the science the right way, we needed a lot of capital. So that meant we needed to kind of go public as soon as we could. And at that time that required some clinical data, maybe it's coming back to that. And we thought if there was a partnership that could bring in a lot of capital and capability, we could really expand the pipeline in parallel yeah. um, a little more aggressively. So uh, we ended up um, at the time working with Sanofi and that was an interesting process because that happened within, I want to say six to 12 months of me joining. I kind of stepped into a dialogue that um, a few dialogues at Third Rock had kind of started to cultivate and yeah. it was pretty exciting. We we ended up working with Sanofi at the time. It seems like ancient history, but, you know, completely different executive team, like mm -hmm. everybody. I, I don't think there's anyone on yeah. that team that's still there. So Elias Zerhouni was running R&D. Mm -hmm. Chris Viebacher was the CEO and they were the champions uh, along with a guy named Andy Plump, who's now running R&D at Takeda. And uh, Chris left the company three months after the deal was signed. I think Andy left maybe six or nine months after. Elias kind of hung on um, for a little bit longer. And the idea was PCSK9s, and they were going to launch their PCSK9 product, and it was going to be the cornerstone of a cardiovascular kind of growth strategy. And we were going to be a part of that. Well, if you've watched the PCSK9 space, the, the commercial projections were really, really different, and that just didn't materialize. Um, and so we found ourselves in a situation with a partner who wasn't as committed anymore with a team that was going in a different direction. Now, of course, we, we felt this, right? When you're in a relationship, you know this is happening. You're looking for things. You're looking for reassurances. And ultimately, it was really about the commitment to the disease and therapeutic area, less about like, you know, the capital, right? Because if you don't have a committed partner, what are right. you doing? And so we started to have conversations around evolving the relationship. And, you know, there was a scenario which we thought was, you know, essentially a net positive, right? Short of a committed partner, a net positive, which was a thoughtful dissolution. Well, it wasn't quite how the market saw it. And, um, you know, it was early January before JP Morgan, let's get the news out before JP Morgan so we could talk to people. And the stock really crashed. And um, it took us three or four months for it to recover. Okay. Um, but, you know, you're thinking about that and you're like, all right, you know, we have a company, though, 
that we've invested time and energy in culture, values, people, and people didn't panic. We definitely, there were questions, right? Um, not everybody in the company had the same sort of like uh, visibility and had a front row seat to kind of the, the dynamic that was evolving here in the strategy. But when you spend the time on the mission, that never changed. Values never change. Fundraising strategy can change. Data can come at you that's different, you know, and you should respond to the data. Is the data positive? Do we have an upside case? Can we accelerate a clinical trial? So for us, Joan, it, 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 it was everything, right? Spending the time with the people, the culture, the mission, and then thinking about the strategy and the various, you know, permutations that can happen at inflection points ahead of time it just is, I, you know, it's classic change management. If you want to look at it that way, over communicate, have people think about various scenarios. So when it happens, folks are, are ready to sort of process it quickly and move on. And there's confidence, right, that the organization has that, hey, yeah, we thought this was a possibility and we're ready for it. Right. Or we're more ready for it than if we were flat footed. So before we wrap out this part of the discussion, there was a question in the chat. So tell us what was the mission and what were the values? Yes. So the mission of the company was to change the lives of people with serious cardiovascular disease through bold and innovative science. We, you know, we spend time, I, we can talk for hours about just the process of developing mission, vision, values, but I'll, I'll, the punchline of it is must be organic, must be sort of inclusive of multiple levels in the organization to really make it sticky and make it be real. So, and every word in that statement was carefully chosen. We were an innovative company. We were going to invest in science. We were focused on cardiovascular disease and precision medicines for cardiovascular disease. We we're going to do it different. So that's basically the mission. Then we kind of distilled from that a strategic plan. And I have to say, you know, we had, initially we had a, a three-year plan that we put in place very early. And like you said, like your mom said, we were going to get it wrong, but it's better to have a map and then react, right, than to have no map at all. You'll, you know, it'll take you wherever you want if you have no map at all, right? And you won't know where the hell you are when you get there. The, over time, we started to look at five-year increments and we developed a, a horizon framework, horizon one, two, and three, moving out to vision 2020 was horizon one, 20, drive to 25 was horizon two, and then looking out to 20. 30 was the third it's important and i'll tell you why because you're involving people along the way you're getting folks to you're forcing the conversation to look ahead which means you have to think about scenarios so as we pulled that that mission back we wanted to bring it into a strategy and the strategy in the first few years was we need to get our medicine approved it was mavicampton mm -hmm. and you know thrilled like a month and a half ago it got approved by the fda yeah. so that is awesome far more exciting than you know, the, the, the milestone of BMS acquiring the company is this and having people being prescribed a medicine that you, you discovered and worked on is game changing. My first in my career, I can't take credit for any of the stuff we worked on at Merck. Um, I was a member of a very large team, but it, that, you know, that's 25 plus years on, so yeah. it ain't easy. Um, but the, the values part of it for us was equally important because it permeated into our, our hiring plan in our interview process, in our promotion process, in our performance management process. And we basically held people to the how they did things, not just the what. And that gets really tough when you have kick ass executing smart people yeah. who are not a values fit, right? Mm -hmm. I think generally we all know what to do with situations where there's you know, incompetence or something like that. You know, hopefully it happens rarely, but when it does, you know, it's not an existential crisis. But when you're faced with like, yeah. super high impact people. And that happens. Um, what are you going to do if they're not a cultural yeah. fit? And our, our values were patients first, lifelong learning, um, succeed together, imagine and innovate and a passion for science. And so everybody from, you know, the, uh, the facilities team to the finance team needed to be excited about the science we were doing. They didn't have to do the science, but they had to be excited about it because we invested in it and that was the kind of culture we want to bring as an example. So yeah, that um, they're still sort of etched in, in my mind, um, which says something too. 
So we, well, and, and I remember a time when I was at a corporation and they were bringing out the new values and the corporation was 40 years old. And, um, you know, and it was a video with Moses coming down from the mount with them on a tablet and then everybody got them on a tablet and to this day nobody still remembers them so you you really have to live the values not just put them on a website well you're getting into something joan we we did so there's a moment in time to do it it's like the values are at some point i think we were maybe 20 or 30 people and we're like we really need this because yeah. we're, we're feeling disconnected at 20 to 30 people and so it was that there, we pulled together a values team. That values team had, you know, various levels on it. I was the sponsor, but there was no one on the executive team that was on the committee. It was sort of director level and below. And I mean, they nailed it and it was organic to your point. Yeah. It was, you know, who are we, right? And what do we think is special about this? So there, it was, you know, it was sort of a snapshot of reality, right? In terms of, you know, what we're doing here. And it's a great time to kind of capture it because, you know, it gets harder and harder as the company grows and scales, as you know, right? Yeah. Because you can't put your finger on, on every single hire. So you have to sort of, you know, really have that stuff embedded. And the last point I'll make on that, Joan, is to living it. You know, we had moments afterwards where we would do, you know, we would do sort of spot checks on, you know, company kind of temperature. Mm -hmm. um, we would do two a year. And, you know, you, you got to pay attention to the feedback and some of the feedback was telling us we're not living our values. So, you know, we had to re invigorate the, yeah. the team and sort of think about where are their spots that were missing it. And, you know, that's when we really kind of pulled it in in a more effective way in our hiring process and in our you know, year end reviews. It was kind of there, but it was sort of wishy washy. Yep. So anyway, it's it's a process that you have to prioritize, like, you know, filing an NDA. I mean, mm -hmm. you got to be on it all the time. Yep, absolutely. So thank you for that. And um, yeah, I, one of the things um, Ann Rhodes, who was the first VP of people at Southwest Airlines, said to me one time was, you know, Joan, you can always train skills, but you can't train values. You got to hire right. for the values. And it's so important. So one of the questions came from the chat, and I'm going to incorporate that into our um, our next question. So fiduciary, you know, boards of directors that have fiduciary responsibility, not advisory boards or SABs, but the people that can make truly make or break the decisions in the company. Um, you know, how did you select your board members? What did you feel were that was the key values they brought to the company? And then how did they work with you when you made your biggest mistake? So I made a bunch of them early on. And I, and I have to say the, the, the board was just an incredible board in that I was lucky enough, a consequence of the Third Rock investment back then and I think they still do this a little bit. They were the only investor. So, and their model was to start the companies up and essentially to, to exit their position, you know, within you know, 18 months or so right. of an IPO. And so for me, I, I joined the company when I had an opportunity to really help event, design and develop the board. And so what we, we, I approached it the same way we were approaching the company. Mm -hmm. We assembled a team of mission-driven values-based leaders. So I ended up very early having an entirely independent board. I think that is huge. And I know it's not that easy when we have you know, venture investors, et cetera, but I think it's important to get there. And because all, you know, inevitably your, your board is a team. That yep. team needs to be focused on the same goal. If you're not all on the, on the same journey, and at times, you know, the interests can diverge, right? You hope they don't. And it's not always the case that investors are not thinking about, you know, building a long-term sustainable great company. But for us, it was very important that the way we were gonna win and deliver our mission was to drive our own destiny and be an independent company have a robust pipeline, invest in the science, and those like really drove a lot of our decisions. And you can imagine, you know, I've, I've been around other company boards and if, um, 
it, it's not always that easy to get support um, for you know, investing in things beyond, let's say, the lead program sometimes. And so it, for me, it was really, really important to build that team with the same focus, fortunate again, contextually to be able to do that um, and build independence. Everybody on that board had been a CEO and a leader. And so for me personally, I learned so much from them. They were focused on part of our company culture as well as you know, lifelong learning and developing people. And they were invested in me and my development. I, I, you know, I got a little bit better at this as I went on. I can't say I was like hyper secure and focused on this in the first couple of years. I mean, I think most first time CEOs have this. Um, I certainly did. And so, you know, once I kind of got comfortable being a little bit more, um, I don't know, vulnerable, I guess, and just sort of saying, hey, look, I mean, I don't know everything here and you guys have experience and maybe we all don't know, but let's talk about it. I definitely have a point of view. Things really started moving in a positive direction for the board kind of kind of gelling as well as just you know trust and my own personal growth because they're amazing leaders that I learned a lot from. They were also very complementary to each other. So I think having a diverse set of points of view experience is really powerful when you're aiming it all at the same goal, right? When you're not, I don't know. You can lose some of that power. So I got to say the board and I would I would encourage CEOs also to think about their board composition and you know boards want this, the leaders to lead in the company right and you know if they don't I think you need to have another conversation with them but sort of you know think about how you want to use the board and I will say early on the, it, there was and this is sometimes the necessity of the startup kind of scene board meetings were you know, essentially almost project management reviews, right? You're getting into detail. Where's the program? Every milestone seems existential. And there is a place for that early, but it can't crowd out like people development, culture, long-term planning, you know, planning around the teams. And, you know, that's definitely something if I, I could do over again, I, I would do try and get more of that in. Maybe easier said than done, just given the context that early stage companies are in. But man, it really, really pays off. And so I ended up kind of feeling this board can be a strategic weapon for the company. If we engage them and we pick the right people, they will engage and they, we will learn, they will teach us, we'll ask them questions that they can, you know, you poke holes at. And so we ended up having just a really rich interaction with the board and they spent a lot of time with the company. And remember, I think, you know, Joan, you're on some boards too, like, there's ones that you love to go to. There's probably a few where you're like, okay, I, I'm going to do it. But, and you know, it's like anything. How do you elevate the engagement on any team? Involvement, right? Balanced participation. They felt like they were making an impact because they were, and they looked forward to these meetings and they looked forward to the in-between conversations. So I don't know, you know, the more you put in, if you've designed the right kind of setup, the more you're going to get out. And they were amazing. Um, the fiduciary part of it too, Joan, is interesting because you know they, they were amazing at that too. And for us, at least, if if anyone out there is in a similar situation, you know, we were building a company to drive independent growth, and um, you know, we we never had you know conversations about like you know what do we want to do to optimize a sale. I, I don't think that's ever a good idea, frankly, because ultimately. Um, great science and important therapies create options for companies and you know that's just going to happen so the focus is on the things you can control i don't know how pfizer is going to feel about the world you know we saw our own experience with sanofi right i mean things change markets change it's hard enough to execute on what you can control so if we're focused on that and really looking at important services and products to impact society good things are going to happen and so we're doing that um but you know you also want to have a good feel and we tried to help the board assess and have fluency in you know making value assessments on the company and you know that's you know there's some tactical stuff around that that are a little bit bread and butter but there's also kind of keeping them connected to the key value and drivers and making sure they know them and have like a, a vibe for them otherwise you know how can you expect them to react to inbound and make good decisions that say, you know, we're going to say no to that offer because 
we have more potential as a standalone. So you have to give them the, the substrate to be able to have an honest kind of assessment of that. And sometimes we don't see our boards like that. Early on, I saw my board essentially as like, you know, bosses. Later on, I saw the board as peers. And I think the latter is just much more productive. Well, I, you know, AZ Bio is blessed today with a phenomenal board of directors. And we actually select our board based on diversity of experience and, and what they can bring. Because as I jokingly say, with 275 members and a community of over 300,000 employees that work in those companies, um, I can't solve all their problems. I can't answer all their questions. And our board is the knowledge base that we draw on to, you know, to help all of those people. And we'd be nothing without them. Yeah, sounds like you've got a great board. And, you know, I'm sure you've seen all different flavors of boards, right, Joan? And so it's, you know, um, at times you want to have just honest conversations about people's motivations and what they want out of their, you know, professional engagement. And, um, you know, it's a lesson I learned along the way. I wish I would have known it earlier, but um, I spent a lot of my time early on, Joan, trying to just, you know, um, I don't know, uh, manage and convince uh, as opposed to listen and understand and, you know, ultimately, you know, getting to like clarity of like a situation is a gift and it doesn't have to be like an acrimonious thing uh, if it's a performance fit or anything. And I don't know, it's it, it's a skill that I think everybody needs to develop. It's not something I don't think maybe you've, you've I've probably met a couple of people who are just natural at this, but it's not easy to be natural at, you know, what we perceive to be difficult conversations around chemistry or motivation that are really just exploring like the truth. Right. So if you look at it that way, um, I don't know, I think things end up uh, much easier um, and boards are that way, too. Right. I mean, what are we doing here? Are we on the same page? Do we have divergent um, objectives, which can happen? Mm -hmm. um, and let's just put them on the table and try and work through them. And, you know, rather than just step into a meeting knowing half the group wants to sell the company, the other half wants to kill program number two. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you're in neither camp. That's those are not fun places to be. Yeah, no. And, you know, it's, it's always in the back of the CEO's mind, right? If you truly have a fiduciary board, they can fire you at any time. You know, it's funny you say that. I, I knew I had a good board when like one of my favorite board members after like a great kind of one-on-one -on -one is like, hey, look, I just want you to know we're just trusting you to make good decisions. If you make, you know, more bad ones than good, I'll be the one firing you. I'm like, great. <laughs> I know it's going to be the phone call is going to be from me. It's going to be, you know, it's going to be okay. I'm like, all right, great. It's your job. I'm good with that. Yeah. And, and, but those are, those are things we have to th look at. And, you know, I can't, it, as we transition to this next question, I can't end this session without part pointing out that, um, you know, congratulations on that FDA approval. Um, oh, thank you. As you know, I lost my dad to heart disease and um, it's one of those areas where we just were not getting enough innovation. Um, and so it, it's wonderful to see that happen. Um, and as I you know, remind our innovators all the time, you know, a discovery is great, but it's not an innovation until it's actually changing people's lives. And so congratulations on that. Thanks, Joan. And I, I, those are such wise words, by the way. And I will tell you, if some part of you is is thinking, you know, the right way for the company to move forward is, you know, after phase two proof of concept data for for the company to be acquired by, you know, Merck or someone. I think keeping Jones words in mind will increase the probability of that happening. I mean, ultimately, it's got to be around important therapies that impact society. And if you approach your programs that way and your people that way, um, the, the world of options open up to you. And um, the alternative is just, is not as inspiring, frankly. Um, and, and I'm not trying to be kind of, you know, uh, you know, naive about the realities, but 
you know, it's, it, it's so much easier to move forward in such a complex industry if you're keeping your eye on helping people and reminding your teams that's why they're there. And you got to believe it, right? And if you believe it, wonderful things happen. So um, I don't know, maybe it's cliche, but, you know, good things happen if you're focused on doing great science for the benefit of patients and developing new therapies. And, um, and you'll get, you get much more interest from many, many more people if that's how it's positioned. Because I'll tell you, that's exactly how BMS looked at the world. Um, they said, these guys have done, it, it, this is a robust program, a medicine that really matters. And, you know, a lot, I think a lot of the driver for the value was the fact that, you know, we weren't interested in selling. And it's, it's, you know, we had a extremely viable and attractive independent plan and just could say no yep. up until a point. So that kind of leads into the next part of the discussion. So for many of the people on this call, they are developing either medical devices, health IT, or therapeutics that um, will ultimately get to global scale only through an acquisition partner because the 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 challenge of, of distribution in and of itself is just so large um so a little bit without without telling tales you can't tell um a yeah. little bit about you know what once you made that decision okay we're going to consider this office this offer what was that acquisition process like well i will so one, it was bizarre because it was all via COVID and virtual. So, you know, I'm bringing us all back to that world. Um, we had just, um, you know, we didn't really know what was going on. None of us with uh, COVID in early 2000. Uh, I remember in March, like many of you, uh, I was thinking through what we do with the workforce, etc. cetera. Um, so we had made some decisions around, you know, remote, et cetera. And we did that kind of early. We also early really dug in because we had an ongoing registration study. We had a long-term extension. We had people on our medicine that needed to come back for site visits, right? Mm -hmm. Again, not unusual um, for those you know, of you, you, you've lived through this. So just bringing you back a little bit to that dynamic in that crazy time. Um, and then in May, we, we had unblinded our pivotal study and, um, you know, that was incredible, right? Because it, it was, it was, the data was phenomenal. A lot of the hard work and execution on the study translated into, you know, every endpoint being statistically significant, primary, secondary, exploratories. I mean, it was what you want to see with a targeted medicine, right? Like, hey, this hits the target in the biological pathway and it's doing what we thought and there it is in a registration study. So it wasn't long after that, that we, that I had, and all of this, by the way, is public. Um, those are really fun kind of disclosures, by the way, to look back on like you know, oh, yeah. the deal history. Yeah, you learned some really crazy stuff in there um, sometimes. So um, we got a, I got a call from um, Giovanni Caforio, who's the CEO of VMS. And basically the dialogue was between him and I the entire time, which I don't know what that says, but I think it was great. Uh, and I really enjoyed my interactions with him. And, you know, the, the, the discussions were really early about why, why do you, why are you doing this, Giovanni, right? What's your interest? And, um, you know, let me tell you a little bit of our story with Sanofi and our mission here. And, you know, it's all about the mission and the people. And so most of our conversation early, cause you know, these guys are definitely in a position to diligence, the science, a lot of it was public. We were really, really, um, believed in publishing extensively as well. And, um, you know, it was about really the vision and a shared vision. And, you know, the first piece of that, Joan, was getting um, me, I guess, convinced as I was having the conversation. But then, of course, my, my executive team and the board that there is we share the same mission. We, we, it was all about that. And like, what are you going to do? Let's that's just table stakes. Are we going to transform patient care? is are, are we going to serve the patients better right through a conversation and through a relationship with bms you know and and i got convinced and i saw conviction there i mean ultimately they put their money where their mouth was and and that is you know saying a lot um 
but that was the first piece. And then, yeah, and then you go to conversations around value, which, you know, there were a lot of no's along the way because we just felt we could be a uh, very valuable company in a short period of time. I'm going to give a little bit of plug here for the, the planning process and some of the things we touched on in the last 30 minutes. The board was ready for this, even though we didn't sit and have conversations about like, you know, who could potentially acquire. We talked about what was important. Where is their value to be unlocked? What are the markets missing? Are we doing a bad job communicating to the markets? You know, we got to help them connect the dots. And, you know, we did feel we had an undervalued pipeline, but it was, you know, we had to put our finger on like what and why. And, you know, we had label expansion that, you know, the markets didn't believe until they saw data. Okay, I get that. That's a reasonable place to be. When are we going to get data? Is it the data that's going to be compelling? So we had all these conversations and that then leads you down a path to say, all right, we've got this number on the table. Let's be realistic about what we can do on our own. And, you know, so that went around for a little bit. And at, at, at some point, it just got to a point where it made sense given the vision was shared and we got confidence that, you know, the, our team, our people, and I will say, you know, BMS um, retained the entire team with the exception of like me and my direct reports uh, for, you know, a year plus. Many of them are still there and they are very committed to um, patients with HCM and the cardiovascular space. And I think they've done an incredible job since the acquisition. So it doesn't always happen that way, right? Sometimes you worry that, you know, this is an asset purchase and, you know, sometimes that's okay, right? In, in, in some of the companies that, uh, in some of the, some of the CEOs on the calls here, you know, if you've got a device platform, if you've got, it's a single asset company, I think there's nothing wrong with that at all. It's knowing what you are. And for us, we had built sort of a knowledge bank around the heart that allowed us to get at, you know, a half dozen or so really, really important disease areas where we need new medicines. And, you know, we wanted to make sure that um, that was going to be continued. And um, and so we're encouraged so far. They're going to do an amazing job with, with Chemzios, the Mavic Hampton brand, which was approved a little while ago. And, you know, that was never really um, a, a massive concern of, of ours. I mean, they have their incredible commercial organization. They've done, they've innovated in oncology with precision medicine, so all of that fit. Um, but I'll tell you, it was a um, it was a roller coaster ride, Joan, during those conversations. And, uh, you know, I there was one where at some point in the process, I'm like, shit, I think this is going to happen. And my first feeling was not like, Yahoo. It was, my wife would say, you were like depressed for a couple of days. And I don't know. I mean, I'm not trying to be dramatic about it. It, it. You know, the outcome is fantastic for patients and for, for, for everyone. So I'm not, I'm not saying anything different, but you know, it, it is it's a little bittersweet. And especially with a company like ours, where we've really spent so much time kind of feeling like a family. Um, and in the year and a half since, you know, it's been really gratifying to, to hear people's perspectives on myocardia. And, and everyone had kind of, it feels like a shared experience, which was pretty special. Yeah, it's, um, I, I can tell you from my perspective as a grandma, because I have a few years on you. Um, you know, when it's, it's like when your kids move out and they start a life and they're not totally dependent on you anymore. And then they get married and they have their own families and this new thing blossoms. It's just amazing. But it's it's still tough when the kids move out. And I think that right. when we sell companies, we we have that experience of of that feeling of loss. And that's a good transition to our, our kind of our last section, because we have been talking about what was. And, um, you know, one of my very early mentors said, you know, kid, you did a great job, great success. I'm really proud of you. What are you going to do next? Mm -hmm. What's next for Tassos? Oh, well, so I, I've spent some time trying to think about, you know, what 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 did I do that was, you know, useful and important, understanding kind of my leadership impact and and what I really enjoyed out of the experience. And I'll tell you, you know, a couple of things 
kind of come to the top. One is um, the people and the culture part of it, for sure. Realizing that, you know, uh, recruiting, developing, engaging, kind of trying to understand people's motivations and seeing, you know, if you can help them achieve their full potential mm -hmm. as an individual. And then in a team context, that was that was really, really gratifying. Uh, the second part of it was, you know, strategy and they're interlinked and the complexity. Uh, we could have an hour, Joan. I am like, our industry is so fragmented. We should have way more $100 billion companies than we do. And we don't. And, you know, we can talk all day about how the science is hard and we need a lot of capital. That just tells me that the, the, the reward on that risk profile ought to be there. And I think, and I could be totally wrong about this, that we don't spend enough time early in a company's life developing a foundation and a strategy for scale, which is enabled by people who can scale. And that is just, you know, developing people. I think as an industry, we're, we are, you know, mature, right? And we are sometimes a bit conventional. And, you know, we can look around at almost every other industry and see very different funding models, different commercial models, all of that. Yes, we're innovative and the science is at its heyday. I believe that, but we're not innovating in some key areas like how we design and develop our organizations, our business models, our strategies for partnering. And what's exciting right now is there is a, a clearly a convergence, right, between whether it's tech, data science, whether it's value-based care. I think, you know, maybe it's accelerated by COVID, but there is a mushrooming of new approaches and models for care provision that you know, will pull through novel therapies uh, in a way that I think has to happen or else we're going to be stuck here. I mean, we're, we're still treating some of these cardiovascular diseases with beta blockers, right? And the mortality rate of heart failure is, you know, the five-year mortality rate is worse than stage four lung cancer. So, you know, that hasn't changed in 40 or 50 years, it has to change. And we can't just continue to just, you know, treat people through emergency room visits, right? That's not going to change the cost curve and it's not going to increase standard of care. So I'm spending a lot of time thinking about how, do, how does that Venn diagram come together? The people, the strategy piece, the convergence of new technologies, ultimately with the goal towards, you know, providing exceptional care to everyone, right? in you know the outskirts of arizona in rural uh idaho or in you know inner city chicago you know city where i'm from the, everyone should be able to have access to you know cleveland clinic level kind of heart treatments right and we can do it i think we can do it but we've got to innovate we can do so much more through remote monitoring sightless clinical trials all this stuff that's happening and thinking about devices and therapeutics and then data and care plans. So Joan, somewhere in there, there's a few projects that I'm kicking around. And I got to say too, I would love to have a, a huge presence in, in Arizona for that. I can tell you, uh, again, topic maybe for another day, but it's a wonderful place to be, to live, to raise a family. I think we're in this catch 22 potentially where to attract more talent into what is a risky endeavor, you know, having more and more companies. I mean, I think when I think about it, when I moved to the Bay Area to join my first, you know, private super risky startup, um, I'm like, all right, you know, if this doesn't work, there's, you know, 30 companies across the street. I don't think I would have to just pick up and move and, and go back to where I came from, which is tough to do for families. So somehow we've got to just, and I know you're working hard at this, right? And I know you've got um, some good things cooking around this front, but I'd love five years from now to see just, you know, uh, a 10x increase in the cluster of companies that then just becomes a flywheel. And I think there's a tailwind as it is for talent to want to sort of consider being here. There's no doubt. And, you know, we just got to sort of crystallize that with some a couple things here and there, and, and maybe one of one of one or two of the projects I'm working on can help do that. Well, 
I am so glad that you're now coming and playing with us in the world's biggest sandbox. And um, as I hope you found out, you know, we play very well together in that sandbox. It's a culture in Arizona. And um, it, since I made you, you know, repeat your mission statement, I'll give you ours. Okay. Our vision is that Arizona will become a top 10 bioscience state. And our mission is to work with our members and our partners to get us there. And that's something that our entire board has bought into. Well, let's make it happen. Absolutely. So I think that is a great place to wrap things up. Tassos, thank you so much for joining us today. It was great conversation and definitely won't be the last one. So we'll have to figure out how to take some of those next big things for you and work them into some of the other programs and things that we have going. Um, thank you so much for all of our members for joining us today. And now um, I am going to ask Natalie Mitchell to turn on her camera. She's going to be so embarrassed so that I can add her to the, the stage. So hi, good morning. Um, so everyone, this is Natalie's very last AZ Bio peer session. Mm. She is leaving us and she and her family are going on a new adventure to Greece. Where wow. she, isn't that exciting? Um, so while I am, a, we talked about, you know, having your children leave the nest. Natalie has been such an important part of our team and such an important part of, you know, growing what is now AZ Bio Peers that I wanted you all to have the opportunity to say thank you. So um, feel free to put a note to Natalie in the chat send her a note at natalie at azbio.org. Um, she's going to be helping me from Greece just for a little while as we wrap things up. But Natalie, this, what you've built and bringing someone like Tassos to the community to share his experiences is something to be very, very proud of and bon voyage. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to work with everyone. Okay, you can turn it off before you start crying. Good luck, Natalie. <laughs> um, but with that, thank you everyone for a phenomenal um, first half of the year with AZ Bio Peers. Um, just so you know, we are going to um, take July off so that everybody can have a little bit of summer vacation. We will be back in August. And again, um, huge thank you to Tassos Giancakis for sharing a little bit of his story from the road. And um, we look forward to seeing everyone in September at the White Hat Life Science Investor Conference, where you can find the next myocardia for your investment portfolio. Thanks, everybody. Make it a good week. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thank Adios. You. Bye.